Welcome to this webinar from Electrolube. We will be going through the topic of encapsulation resins, where and when to use them. The very first question that's always asked is why should I encapsulate? And the simple answer is for protection against a various range of environmental elements such as chemicals, dust, moisture, ozone, corona discharge, shock, temperature, thermal shock and UV degradation. There are various different levels of protection that can be provided for components. The most basic level is no protection at all, where all the components and the board remain exposed. Then we have nano, very thin layers providing minimal protection at approximately 1 to 50 nanometers. And then we have conformal coating, which is a standard type of coating system providing average protection at approximately 10 to 15 microns. Then we go on to the ultra-thick systems, which are heavy-duty coatings providing improved protection compared to a standard conformal coating, between 100 to 500 microns. And finally we come on to the encapsulation versions, which provide the best range of protection. These are usually greater than 500 microns, or half a millimetre thick. Both the two terms encapsulation and potting resins are used interchangeably. However, there is actually a difference. Encapsulation is where the resin is cast around the individual components on the PCB. However, in potting, a permanent mould is used and then the resin is poured in to encapsulate the components and the entire board. The majority of encapsulation resins are two component systems. These are also known as 2K and they have a number of distinctive advantages. They can be used over a wide temperature range, usually liquid and dispensable at room temperature of 20 degrees centigrade. They can be stored at an ambient temperatures of between 15 and 30 degrees centigrade, normally solvent free, can be either cured at one temperature or elevated temperatures, they have a good shelf life and a wide range of dispensing equipment is readily available. Now we will discuss the basic types of resin chemistries. Three main types are commonly encountered, epoxy, polyurethane and silicon. These come in a wide range of different colours and viscosities, but fundamentally it is actually the cured resin properties that are of real interest. Based on the cured properties of a resin, you can make an educated guess as to the main resin chemistry that would be required for your particular application. First off we have adhesion. Most resins have good adhesion, however epoxy resins do exhibit the best overall performance over a wide range of substrates than silicon or PUs. Chemical resistance. Epoxies are resistant to most chemicals over both polyurethane and silicon. However, if you need water resistance, PU or silicons offer excellent protection. Physical shock. Polyurethanes and silicons are good. Tough resins designed to withstand any form of impact while being flexible, so while epoxies are much harder and stronger, epoxies are also more brittle. And thermal shock, all resin versions have a certain operating temperature range that they operate within comfortably. Silicon being the broadest, from minus 60 degrees up to 250 degrees centigrade, then epoxies from minus 40 up to 200 degrees centigrade, and finally polyurethanes from minus 50 to plus 150 degrees centigrade. There are also various other more specialist properties available with different resin versions. First, flame retardancy. In order to achieve this, the resin must pass flame tests. This is measured independently, which is normally done with the Underwriter Laboratory, or UL, certification. The approval given actually technically applies to the completed board or components, and the completed unit must pass in order to obtain the classification of UL94. In case of thermal conductivity, many elements have got smaller and smaller over the years, and this has increased the density of the components on the PCB, which in turn has meant that more heat is being generated per unit area. This leads to the requirements to have thermally conductive resin in order to help dissipate the heat away from the components and keep them operating efficiently. 
A further area that's becoming more common these days is radio frequency transparency. This is due to an increasing number of components using Wi-Fi connectivity in order to allow services such as the Internet of Things to become a reality. So many different RF transparent versions are needed in order to allow the communication signals to pass through the resin and still providing a degree of protection required. So let's delve a little deeper into each chemistry type. We'll start with epoxies. These are typically two component systems. Part A is typically the epoxy part, with part B containing hardeners such as amine. The usable life and pot life will vary between products, but it's usually between 30 to 120 minutes, with full cure achieved within 24 hours at room temperature. That cure time can be reduced by increasing the cure temperature up to 80 degrees centigrade. There are also single component systems available, where you have a usable life of about 26 weeks at 20 degrees centigrade. In order to cure these materials, you have to cure between 90 and 120 degrees centigrade to get the desired property. Now let's look at our first case study, which in this particular case is a customer who is looking to encapsulate the battery packs that they had designed for a particular automotive application. The customer required a resin to seal lithium ion battery packs, and these are to be used in electric vehicles. The resin had to meet UL94-V0 approval. It had to have good chemical resistance and also provide good thermal conductivity. So with all these key properties in mind, the Electrolube technical support team recommended a couple of epoxies from the range. ER2218 and ER2220, which would both meet these requirements. Looking at the ER2220, there are certain benefits for this application. It has a low mixed system viscosity, 15,000 millipascal seconds, it has a thermal conductivity of 1.4 watts per meter Kelvin, and meets the UL V0 approval. So, after discussion with the customer, we recommended this resin for testing. The customer then undertook some trials watching potting of some of their battery packs. Following trials, they found that actually they only needed to pot the top layer to provide the sealing and protection they required in order to meet the requirements of IP7. So this led to a redesign of the unit, which allowed them to reduce the overall weight of the unit by only using a thin layer of epoxy rather than potting the entire unit. They also found that this allowed them to use another material, in this case a phase change material, to further improve thermal performance. However, on running tests on the new unit, it was found that the epoxy was actually softening during cycling. It was found that the phase change material used was actually attacking the epoxy. Electrolube undertook lab testing of the phase change material in our research and development centre with different resins and found that below phase change temperature, there weren't any problems with any of the epoxy resins. But above the phase change temperature of between 45 and 55 degrees, the epoxy starts to soften. We tested a number of other versions of both epoxy and polyurethane to find compatibility with the phase change material, and actually found that the ER2162 and the ER2221, as well as the UR 5547 and the UR7005 all showed good resistance without any sort of softening during thermal shock tests run between 20 and 80 degrees. All of these versions of resins also met the requirements for the UL flame retardants. We recommended to the customer that they use ER2221 as this product is produced in all of our sites, manufacturing sites in India, China and the UK, which also would allow them to assure global supply. So the customer trialled the ER2221 with their unit and found that they were able to obtain the desired resin layer thickness with the phase change material. 
Although the thermal conductivity of ER2221 was lower than the original material, 1.2 compared to 1.54 watts per meter Kelvin, they actually found that the resin density was lower, 1.88 compared to 2.22. This allowed them to reduce the weight of the final unit even further. ER2221 also allowed them to enable an automated production line. With support from the technical support team, they set up a preheat for part A at 40 degrees centigrade to lower the viscosity, with a slow stirrer in the reservoir to maintain an even distribution of the filler. We also selected a good static mixer to ensure a good mix between part A and part B before the resin was dispensed. Completed units have all passed the customer requirements. So what can we learn from this case study? When using mixing equipment, there should be several key points to consider. If the material is viscous, a preheater can be used to bring the viscosity down and allow more efficient mixing and dispensing. With filled systems, it is important to ensure that the reservoir is stirred to ensure a good even distribution of the filler throughout the material. Depending on the material, you should not place more than one shift's worth of material in the reservoirs. After material is poured into the reservoir, make sure to allow any entrapped air to escape before beginning the production line. If the material is silicon or polyurethane, it is important to ensure no moisture can contaminate the material. Desiccant towers and dry air can be used in production areas to ensure no moisture can react with the resin. The choice of static mixer is also critical to achieve the correct mixing of the part A and part B. Remember, Electrolug's technical support team are always on hand to help with any of the above points. Next, we will look at polyurethane resins. Again, these are typically two component systems, with part A being made up of polvol and part B lecyanate. Usable life is typically between 30 and 60 minutes, and again a fuel cure can be obtained within 24 hours at room temperature, and this can be reduced by elevated heating up to 6 degrees centigrade. We have a case study here looking at LED lighting. So a customer contacted our Bangalore technical team, and it was regarding an urgent solution where they were using an LED decorative strip for a shopping mall. The completed unit had to be a neutral light 4000K. It was for an exterior application, which had regular pedestrian footfall, and they needed a sample for qualification within 24 hours. We recommended the polyurethane UR5634, which is a tough, optically clear resin, However, when they first initially tested it on their unit, the colour temperature obtained was too high. They contacted the technical support team, who suggested they try a different LED with a low colour temperature in order to balance the colour shift and be closer to the desired 4000K. A second option was to reduce the amount of resin applied, as the colour temperature shift can be controlled by the resin thickness. Upon our technical support team examining the units, we found out the customer was actually assigning a diffuser strip after potting the unit. By switching the resin to the UR5635, which is an opaque light diffusing version of the UR5634, we could remove this and more easily determine the optimum potting depth to achieve the correct colour. By using a stage potting process, we also minimalised any problems due to the geometry of the unit, such as trapped air bubbles, giving them a perfect finish. We produced a sample and sent it to the clients within the 24 hour deadline. The unit was approved, with the unit being produced using UR5635 and without the diffuser strip. There was also a cost benefit to the customer, with no diffuser and a thinner layer of material used than originally planned. The LEDs were installed and have been functioning perfectly in the shopping mall since. It's quite often found that by reducing the amount of material used, it is possible to get the desired optical properties in the finished unit. 
Finally, we'll look at silicon resins. Generally, they come as single part systems that will have a pot life of between 10 to 30 minutes for a skin time. Generally, most are moisture curing with a full cure of about 24 hours. Two component systems, part A and part B, are silicon, and you have a skin time of around 30 minutes. And the cure temperature varies from room temperature up to 60 degrees centigrade. So, so here, here we have, have a silicon, silicon case, case study. study. This, this time, time we're, we're looking, looking at LED, LED driver, driver units. units. An, An Indian, Indian lighting, lighting manufacturer contacted us. us. They, they required, required a resin to pot, pot a new LED, LED driver, driver design. design. They, they required the resin to be thermally conductive, conductive be moisture resistant, resistant it needed to be able to withstand thermal cycling, and finally it had to be compatible with existing mixing machinery on their production line. We suggested the SC4001, which met the initial requirements, and while the customer found that the thermal conductivity met requirements, the cure time and gel time were too long, and the hardness of the cure product was too hard at A45. Another more minor consideration was that they did not like the grey of the SC4001. In this instance, we did not have another option available to meet these new criteria, so the local R&D team developed a bespoke resin, SC4010. The new product was developed with increased cure and gel times, allowing us to cure at room temperature while maintaining the thermal conductivity. It provided increased flexibility while being able to withstand thermal cycling, and it was more viscous, allowing the resin to flow around components more easily in the small design. Testing such as the thermal shock testing and development was undergone in partnership with the UK lab team. So once initial development had been undertaken, we worked closely with the customer to approve the lab samples before full customer trials commenced. The customer used automated dispensing equipment in order to apply the resin. Initially, a new pattern needed to be programmed for dispensing to ensure the best coverage of the unit was achieved. Once this was in place, the resin achieved the requirement criteria for cure, room temperature with a 10 to 15 minute skin time and a full cure achieved within 8 hours. This eight hours was important for production, as units potted at the beginning of the shift were ready to be handled and transported away for the end of the shift. Once the initial testing was completed and the customer was happy with the performance, we then addressed the issue of the color. The resin was pigmented white so that it blended in with the driver design. In practice, once the units went into production, the customer found that they could achieve a full cure within five hours. This made the resin much easier to handle than the resin they had previously been using. Production times were shortened, and the new resin offered thermal conductivity of 0.6 watts per meter Kelvin, which in turn increased the lifetime of the driver. One item which is often overlooked with encapsulation is cleanliness. In this case, over time the customer complained that the resin potted in his units was discolouring and creating yellowish patches in the driver. It was found upon inspection that this was being caused by solder flux left behind on the board before the unit was potted. Cleaning the PCB and components before potting is crucial to ensure that not only the resin performs as expected, but also to prolong the life of the unit. This is due to a number of things. Surface contamination will prevent the resin adhering to the PCB properly, which can create air pockets. The contaminant can prevent the resin curing properly by interfering with chemical reaction. This is especially the case with silicons, which are very sensitive to contaminants. Contaminants on the board can cause corrosion to components under the resin, or leach through the resin and cause other undesired consequences. So the key learning points. The customer used automated dispensing equipment with a robotic arm. 
The correct choice of static mixer to maintain flow rate and mixing efficiency was crucial. Flow of material around the components is important. You need to consider the placement of the material to ensure efficient coverage. Air must be displaced from the unit in order for the resin to fully encapsulate and avoid voids. Boards should be cleaned before potting, especially if the resin is clear or white and low level contamination can ruin the appearance of the unit and cause other problems. Encapsulation process. Resins can be produced by hand, although unless this is done in the form of specialist mixing packs, we would generally advise against this. Electrolu provide mixing packs pre-measured and ready to use, and instructions are available on our website. Generally though, for production runs, the best practice is to use a machine to mix and dispense the resin. By using machine, you can ensure that the process is fast and efficient. You get a consistent mix throughout production, i.e. isn't reliant on the skill of an operator and application is always uniform. While some smaller companies are put off by the expense of mixing equipment, it is worth remembering that they can be used for multiple products. Different static mixers are available to improve this process. There are a large number of manufacturers of mixing equipment out there. And when selecting resin mixing equipment, there are a number of key points to consider. How much resin will be run through the machine per shift or over the day? How much will be dispensed per shot? How many shots per unit will be required? What is the mix ratio of the resin? What is the capacity of the reservoir? Is heating required either of part A or part B? Do you require the part A or part B to be stirred? Will the dispensing be fully automatic or will it be manual? and is atmospheric or vacuum potting required. So the next case study we're going to look at is an electric drive motor for a German automotive customer. We were approached by a large German manufacturer who acquired a resin to encapsulate the wiring around an electric drive motor SATA for the next generation of powertrains. The resin was required to have good adhesion to aluminium, good adhesion to plastics, it needed to be flame retardant to UL94-VO, have good thermal conductivity, and have a low enough viscosity to flow around the cabling. ER2220 was put forward to the customer as a possible solution, and samples were sent to the customer for testing. The customer already knew that we would be purchasing Schurgenflug mixing and dispensing equipment, so we were able to carry out testing in their technical center in Germany. The process would use two component mixing equipment with a static mixer and a vacuum chamber. In the video here, you can see the resin flowing up through the motor housing and the vacuum working by drawing out the air bubbles from the small or complicated geometries formed by the cabling and cable harnessing. This is a very efficient way of potting the unit and at the end you can see there's a nice smooth surface. So the learning points. There are some huge advantages to using vacuum potting. It removes the air quickly with minimal air voids in the finished unit. 
This results in a better quality finish and therefore a more reliable unit. The processing time is also increased, partially for more complicated units such as this one, you don't need to wait for the air to escape on its own accord. Now onto thermally conductive resins. All resins are thermally conductive to a greater or lesser degree. Most unfilled polymers are in the 0.2 to 0.3 watts per meter Kelvin range. Adding fillers or modifying the polymer structure will change the thermal conductivity. Once a resin's thermal conductivity reaches 0.8 watts per meter Kelvin, then we would usually consider this as thermally conductive. The advantages of thermally conductive resins are, it helps to dissipate heat away from components, it helps to extend the service life of critical components, and it reduces the long-term running costs. So here we have a customer who is using a Dow Corning material to encapsulate transformers used for domestic appliances, but approached us looking for a faster curing material. They wanted to improve factory throughput, they required a room temperature cure. Due to the thermal mass of the transformer, thermal curing was not an option. And they also wanted to maintain thermal conductivity of the cured resin. The customer contacted the Bangalore technical team to discuss a solution, and the team recommended the SC4003. The customer undertook a pilot trial and found that the resin flowed into the material well. It had a better thermal conductivity than the existing resin. The resin flowed into the coils without voids present, but unfortunately the room temperature cure was just too long at 24 hours. Lab trials showed that we were able to develop a faster cure speed, and trial batches were sent to the customer. The customer preferred the fastest curing of the two, which gave a cure time at room temperature of 5 hours. This was a huge 79% reduction on the original Dow resin. The thermal conductivity was also improved by 34% on the original resin. With the reduced cure time, manufacturing time was reduced, and overall the units performed as well as the previous resin. For prototyping or low-level production, manual mixing and dispensing is often used. Small kits are available, but the most effective method of manual mixing is to use resin packs. These have parts A and B pre-measured to ensure you get the right mix ratio, and once the central clip is removed, can be mixed in the bag they are supplied in. Extra care must be taken when mixing by hand to ensure that air bubbles are not entrapped in the resin. Using part kits is not recommended. You should always mix the full kit and dispose of excess resin accordingly. Always ensure that you maintain the correct mix ratio. Mix quality can vary between operators. Even skilled operators will not get exactly the same results every time, especially over time where they may become tired. We would not recommend mixing large quantities by hand. For example, we had a customer in New Zealand who was purchasing 5 kilogram kits of polyurethane. They will produce units Monday to Thursday and then leave them to cure. They were only mixing 500 to 800 grams of resin at a time, and therefore the kit cans were opened multiple times. Each time the part A would be stirred before decanting. The customer complained that over time the resin was bubbling up while it cured. This bubbling up only seemed to be occurring over the summer months when the kit was part used. This is a classic example of moisture ingress in a polyurethane. Water reacts with the acyanate in the resin, forming carbon dioxide. The result can vary from small bubbles forming to a full volcano of foam, depending on the strength of the reaction. This can be solved by keeping the lids tightly shut, but better still, try to only use the size kit or pack appropriate to your application. 
you can also control the humidity within the working environment with dehumidifiers. Thank you so much for listening. For more information, please visit the Electrolu website, where we have a wide variety of articles and blogs available. Our technical support team are also always on hand to answer your questions.